Okay, well, good evening, evening, everybody. Thank you very much indeed for the reintroduction, which was flatteringly overblown. Um, I think, I, I don't know, I think probably I was a conservationist before I became a farmer, and then I became a farmer. I worked in agriculture, though I wasn't a farmer. And then I went back to nature conservation, then I came back to farming and now I'm back to probably where I belong, which is nature conservation. So I'm going to sort of give you some background to where we are with regard to beavers. But if you don't understand the other context of um, of where we are as a nation on this island, then where we are, the, the battle for the beavers is 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 difficult to get in perspective. The long and the short of it is that we have had cartilage as a species of this island. We've had we've been a dominant species probably since the Bronze Age. As soon as you get to the Bronze Age, then it's us and our fortunes that dictate what other wild creatures um, live on, on this island with us. And it's fair to say that we have fought the bitterest of battles against them. So, you know, you look at the, 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 the adaptable species that was the wolf that hung on almost certainly in the far north of Scotland well into the 1700s. And it really wasn't until the social situation changed and, and you had the 45 rebellion and then all sorts of with all sorts of ramifications that that animal almost as an incidental thing was just wiped from the face of, 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 of the British Isles. Next slide. There's a lot of talk about rewilding. Um, there's a lot of talk about what can be done and what can't be done. And when it comes to species it's and the restoration, it's not easy. It's not easy from a cultural point of view. It's not easy from a practical point of view. So as soon as you hear people starting to talk to, to others about the possibility of restoring free living herbivores like the moose or the bison, then, then you know, I have to say now, I view anybody that speaks of this lightheartedly with a great degree of scepticism, because these are not easy animals to live with in a developed landscape. Next slide. You hit one with a car on the M25 or the M40 or the, the M5 or the M6 or any motorway that happens to be adjacent to where you stay, and this is the end result. And you better hope and pray that when it comes through that windscreen, you're already dead, and the people in the back seat are already dead, because in the last moments of its life, of, of its and your life, what it's going to do is it's going to kick you to death, and that's not a good way to finish. The restoration of creatures like this is very difficult. If you think um, that is not that is not the case, then all you need to do is look at the deer accident statistics from Britain and the deer death statistics from Britain. Somewhere in the region of about 200 people a year are killed when it comes to collisions with a red deer or a fallow deer. If you have a deer the size of the cow, of a cow wandering through the landscape, even given that there is living space for this creature, which there quite patently is not, given that it's a large wetland browser and that we only have 1% of our wetlands left on this island, then you begin to realise that this is an aspiration which would be very, very difficult indeed. Next slide. So we've had cartilage of this island since the Bronze Age. That's approximately five, six thousand years. And it's fair to say that our battle would start with nature in terms of draining land, in terms of clearing forests, and then we would have creatures that we want to destroy, like the wolf, um, to ensure that our flocks were safe at night. And then we had a whole range of other uses for all manner of other smaller beasts. We had small birds that we put in cages to delight us with their song. At different times, we took the plumes from the other gaudy ones that perhaps inhabited the last of the dwindling wetlands or were unfortunate enough to, to fly from continental Europe and think that Britain might give them a home. We had medieval feasts where the, the power of an archbishop or a king or a noble was displayed with all its pomp. And it wasn't just about eating. It was showing that you could reach out and deliver 5,000 night herns and beavers and wild bulls and, and boar and, and that your reach as a person was powerful. It wasn't about eating at all. It was about oppressing the people around you, you know, with your own, your own grandeur and your own, your own charisma. And we ate a lot of things that now have long gone. You had taxidermy. So you had people called moochers who lived in the countryside that were itinerant laborers with their poor, starving children. And when they went out every day to try and glean another new living from the primroses they collected and put in wicker baskets to send to the flower markets in London, 
anything at all that moved in that landscape that attracted their attention was something they'd pay attention to. And if they thought it delivered, you know, some promise of, of financial reward, then the gaudy birds would be killed, their eggs would be taken to the big house, and, and they, again, would not last long. We had people called gamekeepers, you know, where people that, you know, basically do, who do not have much of a heritage on this island at all. They come at the time of the, the Industrial Revolution when, when people make money and move out into the landscape to own big houses with parklands that are reshaped by Robert Adam. And, and, and their creed determines that everything that's got hook claws or sharp teeth or a, 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 or, 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 or a sharp bill has to die as well to preserve the, the pampered pheasants and partridges. You have punt gunning, you have egg collection. In every way, shape or form you can think, you have us stripping nature from the land. Next slide. And we have great absurdities. You know, we forget that until very long ago, you know, not so long ago, in fact, you know, the bear baiting was a legal thing. It finished as a, a pastime in the early 1800s. But right up until, you know, a time well after the Second World War, people were bringing bears and tame wolves across to, to Britain to amuse people at country fairs. It's very difficult when you, you consider the complexity and depth of this heritage to actually nowadays get a handle on when some of these creatures that we knew were once native actually finished. I was speaking not so long ago to a girl who's done a, a PhD on the DNA of bears in Britain, and she told me that it's virtually impossible to tell when a British bear finished and all the other things came in. Because as soon as you look at claws that you find in a Saxon settlement at West Stowe or a, a skull that you find somewhere else or, or the name for the, the bear wards, house or, or, the, or the bear dens in, in London or Lincoln, then you, what you see is not a, an animal that's dwindling on the basis of being caught you know, from its den in the winter in the highlands. What you see is all these poor shackled things being brought from Europe to amuse us in the streets. Next slide. So our war with nature, with the big animals, is over. We are not going to be the people beheading wolves anymore and leaving them on the on, on the, the steps of our parliament to send a message to the politicians that we, the farmers, do not want to have these, these foes of the sheep protected. That war's over and that time is done. Now we have moved in to a new time of even greater danger. Because with the removal of the wild, removal of nature, removal of the wetlands, drainage, deforestation, we now have cartilage of all the land. Next slide. And what we've created is a terrifying apparition. We've created a landscape of near complete order where everything finishes where the straight line of a government grant dictates. If there were forests in this landscape, if there were you know, trees, then those trees would be plantations. They wouldn't be copses of, of ancient oak with, 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 with dunnocks singing in their bowls or pied flycatchers nesting in their upper cavities. They would just be rank upon rank of Sitka spruce, creating a landscape where, okay, starlings might live if there is food enough for them in the surrounding landscape, but nothing else would where we have complete control. Even the water courses you see there will be flailed year on year, living nowhere, nowhere at all for a water bowl to live. Next slide. So when you start to look at landscapes that we're all familiar with, I live in the southwest here, and, and last year with the rise in fertilizer prices, we farmers that would, you know, have assumed that three cuts of silage that would, were all they were ever capable of doing are now trying to get five. And they're trying to get the early sugars in the spring as cheaply as they possibly can to boost the milk production of the dairy cows. When you look at fields like this, okay, here, you have a strip of wild grassland in the middle, but very few have that left. What you've got is something that is mown and mown and mown again. So even a tiny thing, a, a, a short-tailed vole at 30 grams or a, a harvest mouse at 10 is absolutely no prospect of living in this seemingly green space. Next slide. And if it's not in the croplands being shorn by sheep or, or mown by the dairy farmers, then it's in these arable lands. 
you know, where where you have toxins and pesticides of all sorts applied to the fields, leaching day in, day out into the water courses and the environments that surround them. Once again, you know, with modern agricultural techniques and machines, these leave very little to be gleaned by the birds or the mice um, when the season finishes at the end of the year. Next slide. So we start with a fight with the bears and wolves in the Bronze Age and the Iron Age. And by the time we get to our own time, our battle now is with the tardigrades. I was at a presentation the other day where one of the guys from Wild Ken Hill showed us, he did a, a, demo, a presentation about soil health, and he showed us a, a slide, a magnifying glass slide, which is tiny, I don't know, maybe it's, I don't know, an inch by an inch. And he said that within that slide, there should be 33,000 bacteria in the sample of soil, soil he was about to show us. And, and the soil is everything. Without the soil, without a healthy soil, predators, organisms in the soil that pull down leaf litter, that pull down you know, the materials left from a decaying carcass into the soil to nurture itself. If you don't have a healthy soil, then you don't have an environment. And in the slide, it should have been 33,000 bacteria He'd, he'd, he'd taken a red felt tip pen and ringed the ones he could find, and there were five. So we're no longer fighting with the big animals. What we've done is created wastelands that are near complete, but even the tiny ones don't survive. Next slide. And when you start to think about recovery and we jump up and down, and we'll talk a wee bit more about beavers later on, you have to bear in mind that the scope of our influence now transcends the ability of much else to put it right. I was in Bavaria, um, you know, two weeks ago. This is a massive nature reserve um, that sits on the Danube um, in the, um, the province of Franconia, created by a water company as an offline habitat to provide living space, you know, for all sorts of creatures. It's vast. We were there in the spring. Um, you know, we saw white-tailed eagles, we saw great white egrets, we saw curlews, all manner of birds. And as you wander around and you look at the activity of the beavers, which are, are there right the way through the landscape, you think, well, this is actually, you know, it just shows, like Rutland Water, that you can accomplish good. But one of the things we also noticed when we wandered around there in the spring was there an awful lot of big carp floating belly up dead. And when I was back there two weeks ago, you walk back through the landscape after a long, hot spell of summer, and you can't see any water at all. What you can see is this floating, soupy yogurt of filaments, of blue-green algae that's toxic, that, that's, that, that's going to destroy the inflow and the outflow, and probably well beyond that, you know, the life that otherwise would exist in the water. So the beavers are there and the beavers are, are, are presumably surviving without issue. We saw one dragonfly the day we visited there, whereas we went to the, when we'd gone to the smaller streams in the uplands where the water supply was purer, we had seen very many. And what you actually have there, again, is just an ecological disaster waiting to trigger itself. Another hot summer. And that water is going to offer living space to very little. There won't be food there anymore. The scale of this destruction is grand. Next slide. And it's affecting so much. You know, when I'm lucky enough to spend a fair bit of time in a year traveling around Britain to see different projects for different species. And it's just heartbreaking to look at things that, you know, have been a cultural part of what we wear for hundreds of thousands and th or thousands of years. When you look at the perils that used to be taken from the freshwater mussels in Scotland and Wales and in England to adorn the crowns of the mighty, then you begin to realize and these things, okay, they were special in their time, but they were there in relative abundance. Next slide. And you realize that these bivalve filter feeders are ancient. Each one of them, you know, might be 120, 160 years old. But what they need to survive are clean gravels and clean water without pollution, without pesticides, without the chlamydias of the cow shit and everything else that we deliver daily to, that, to, to things we don't treat as rivers anymore. We just treat them as turgid drains. Then you realize that they just can't live. There was a colleague of mine who worked, who worked on a, a project to restore them in southwest Wales. And I think in the, the years that he spent looking, he, he caught somewhere in the region 
of 30 or 40 of these adults, you know, in the big rivers like the Wye and its tributaries, you know, alone as entities on beds of filth where they had clung on to, to dear life, you know, with, with great grimness and determination. And he assembled them and he brought them back to his hatchery. And after years of trial and experiment, he's been able to, 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 to get their glaucidia, their larval um, form to, to fix themselves onto the gills of fish, to pupate, um, to, then, to then take these tiny, tiny muscles and put them in petri dishes and, and, and start this, this long growth process to a point where they can actually go back out into rivers if you can find anywhere to put them and live on their own. And next slide. And now the entire population of pearl mussels in southwest Wales is in this. It's in a single freezer in petri dishes, and you have to take a microscope to see the tiny ones. They're so small. You can see the trail, the little trails um, through the silt where they're feeding. But this tiny, precious reservoir of life that is once it was once ancient is all that's left of the species now. Next slide. And with this disaster that we have inflicted on, on the landscape comes this, comes an impact that comes to us all. You know, we, we look at the, the flood, I mean, two, two days ago, my friend who lives in Perthshire sent some, some photographs of Tayside and you can see in the football stadium where the lights are at the top of the stadium, the water rising steadily to reach them. There are no wetlands. There's no, there's no absorption in the ground. The ground's hardened, it's drained, it's compacted. We've taken everything from that landscape that would naturally slow and, ho and, and, and hold water to the point where the water can integrate itself once again into the landscape in a way that's reasonable. Now, they're sure there would always be flooding, but nothing like what we're seeing today. What we've produced by using every centimetre square of the land is cataclysm. Next slide. And as the climate changes, this cataclysm doesn't just apply to too much water in the winter time. Last year, I went to, to look at a project in Sussex. And as I drew, drove from Kent back to Sussex, I was a wee bit early for my meeting. And I passed the first river that we crossed. And I looked down. And there was water in the deep pools, but nothing running between those deep pools. And then I passed the next one. And because I had about an hour to burn before I got to where I need to be, needed to be, you pass the next one, next one's dry. Tributary is dry, no fish, no insects, um, no water voles, no nothing. And if you think this is something that all just regenerates itself again when the water comes once again, if the water comes once again, then think again. Once the insect populations have gone and the aquatic terrestrial population and invertebrate populations have gone, that's it for a very long time. So with global warming, with change, with our engineering of the environments, this is what's coming next. Next slide. And who would ever have thought you'd reach a day? I mean, Oliver Rackham, who wrote all his woodland books about the history of, of ancient coppice and what we did with the woodlands and used the woodlands for, all once famously said many times in the course of his long career that you couldn't make a deciduous woodland burn. Well, he was wrong because that's coming next and it's coming very, very fast. Again, no water, no pools, no ditches, no generated wetlands, nothing natural to stop this happening. And this is a phenomena that's occurring worldwide. Next slide. So the idea that out there, guys, that somewhere there's an Elysium where it's all right and, and nature's restoring itself and birds are singing and small mammals are scratching and frogs are farting in a swamp, that is simply no longer reality. And it's no longer reality for, for most of the world. But in Britain, an intensively used small island, where, as I said earlier on, we've been the dominant species for very many millennia. It's coming very rapidly to an end. Next slide. I've worked with water voles as part of my career. I think I started with them in, the in 1994. And I started at a time when people had begun to realize that an animal that was once considered to be common and widespread as late as the mid 1980s, you know, with a couple of national surveys which showed first that it had declined by 65% and then it had declined by 97%, 
was no longer common and widespread. And in very many parts of Britain, if you're lucky and if anybody ever bothered to collect specimens of this once common animal to put in a museum, this is all you'll find of them. That's it. It's the animals that are in the museum. There's a few of them left. Maybe there's 77,000 left. Maybe there's 130,000 left. But this animal was once the basis of a food chain. It was once the basis of a functioning ecological web. It's it's functionally extinct in whatever way you view it now. It's 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 just gone. It's a ghost. Next slide. So I began to captive breed them. When I started to captive breed them, we knew nothing about captive breeding water bulls. There had been a few university trials and some scientists had tried to breed them in shoe boxes, but it hadn't gone terribly well and it hadn't produced very much. And nobody knew if you could take these tiny relic ones and twos and reintroduce them to anywhere with any certainty they'd survive. So my job from 1994 until about the early 2000s was to make lots and lots of mistakes, many of which were incredibly bitter. And to get to the point where we got to the stage where we knew we could produce them in hundreds and then we could produce them in thousands. And at the time I spent working with them, I think, I mean, we calculated it up a year or two ago. We think between, and when I say I spent working with them, I mean, I is a colloquial term because I'm, I'm no longer having much to do with breeding water bowls. It's all the very able people that work for me. But we think we bred somewhere in the region of about 33,000 for different reintroduction projects as of last year. And, and with this year, it will be somewhere in the region of 34 and a half. And we're doing more and more of this. And we know very well now how, you know, technology's moved on. We know how to eradicate mink in a way for them that is truly disastrous if you coordinate your activities. And also how to breed vast populations of water voles with a broad gene base and to restore them out into the countryside in landscapes where they can go on and do very, very well. But we're not winning. We're not we're not really turning this 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 species fortune around at scale. What we're doing is we're learning about restoration and time and time again when it comes to the challenges that face us, you know, as another little species goes down, as another part of the, the satellite that's heading back towards Earth burning slows away, then then this this learning curve to get us to the point where we can do something more than talk is going to be painful and intricate. Next slide. And water voles are important. This is one of the first reintroductions we ever ran with. It's at Barn Elms in London. And um, it's a site near Richmond. It's approximately 120 acres of wetland. And we put the first population of voles we had in there because it was reckoned that, that mink would never get there. It was too far into the centre of London. We didn't understand strategic mink control at that time in the early 2000s. And we reckoned they'd be fairly safe there. So we put them out, they survived, they did very well, and the population that we put in there in 2001 is still there at this point in time. It spread right the way through the reserve and across the tidal Thames into what limited habitats exist on the other side. But within two years, the mink had found them. But because you have a site staff there who are dedicated and, and quick off the mark, they've never been able to stay and breed, and therefore they've been eliminated just as quickly as they've appeared. Next slide. But when I started with water voles, the whole thing was an exercise in nostalgia. It was about saving Ratty with his wee pal, the mole, and his friend, the toad, you know, to go go sculling up and down the windrush so he could puff his, his pipe amicably and finish his day in the pub drinking a warm pint of bitter. And that's the way we viewed it. And what we completely missed in large part was the fact that this animal was a critical component of ecological processes and, and, and food chains. And if you want an example of that, if you look at the slide on the right-hand side, there's a stream system where there are plenty of water voles. If you look at the slide on the left-hand side, there's a stream system where no water voles remain. And what you can see is that the grasses have completely over, over covered the little stream system. There are no little pools, there are no burrows, there are no complications that are created by the intensive frenetic activity of the voles excavating and re-excavating again the living space. You have a completely different um, you know, vegetative structure. The sweet grasses have not been pushed back. You know, the coleoptiles that produce bitterness that the voles don't much like, you know, don't predominate. And what you've got is you've got an environment that has infinitely less opportunity in it than the one where the voles are. So there's no pools that little dragonflies can use. There's no hiding space for aquatic invertebrates when the winter comes. Next slide. 
There are no burrows that frogs and toads and grass snakes can climb into when autumn comes and they're looking for a winter refuge. There are no hunting grounds that other small mammals can explore to find them. This process all finishes. Next slide. And there's no prey. So if you're a marsh harrier and you're feeding your chicks, or you're a heron and you're feeding your chicks, or you're a great white egret and you're feeding your chicks, once the water voles have gone, then the next species down is a field vole. An adult male field vole weighs somewhere in the region of 30 grams. An adult male water vole weighs somewhere in the region of 330 grams. So if you're a harrier and you're feeding your chicks, when you kill one water vole, to, to compensate for their loss, you're going to have to kill 11 adult male field voles. And that's really difficult. If you switch from water voles to rats, the rats are full of the toxins that we deliver to them. So by the time you start on them, you're going to have a very limited period of life before your liver's so toxic it kills you anyway. So when the water voles go, a whole range of other things stop happening as well. And this is not an incidental type, type, type thing that we can casually dismiss. This is something that's profoundly, profound, has profound and serious implications for a whole range of other living environments and a whole range of the species that occupy them or don't. Next slide. And then we come to this animal. We come to this animal that begins with so much hope. I began my journey with the beavers in the early 1990s. And in the early 1990s, there was a lot of talk about reintroducing beavers and, 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 but nothing else. I mean, there was talk, 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 nothing happening. And I spoke to some of the zoo people about it and they told me, well, there were no European beavers in, in Britain. And it was, it was going to be terribly, terribly difficult to bring this animal in from continental Europe. And it's going to be terribly difficult to quarantine them and terribly expensive. And really the very best thing to do is say that you definitely like to do it, it was a big aspiration of yours, but then just go back to sleep and, and achieve absolutely bugger all. And I looked at it and, and I thought they were wrong. And I went to speak to the circus people who were still present in the environment, in the zoological environment, in numbers at that time. Most of them are, are long gone and dead. But the things they didn't know about animals weren't worth knowing. And they told me that when they'd kept beavers for you know, import or export because they dealt in zoo animals as well, all they ever did was go get them, put a, a bath in a pig pen, fill the, the rest of the pen full of straw and chuck a lot of carrots in every day. And, and occasionally chop willow down. And he said they did absolutely fine. So he looked at that and I came up with a slightly more sophisticated version of that. I went off to Poland to see the guys that were breeding beavers in a, 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 an ex-fur farm at a place called Poppy Elno um, that had been built in the time of, of Stalin to reintroduce beavers to, to the Great Lake systems there so they could be harvested once more. It was an economic project which had run out of time. And they said, of course, we could have the beavers. And we had a few beers and we had a chat about it. And it proved to be the case that none of the paperwork, nothing was a problem at all. It was very easy. It was very straightforward. And I did it. And I brought the first Polish beavers in. And then years went by and we brought them in for enclosures because we could hold them in enclosures. and It was all legal. And nobody ever thought about asking Natural England for a license to do anything with beavers at that time. And there was talk in Scotland and the talk went on for the best part of... I don't know, 20 years, and eventually a license is granted to release a population of 16 beavers, um, you know, eight pairs into to Napdale and Kintyre. Next slide. And it's the Scottish Beaver Trial. It's all terribly august, and it spends 5.2 million to tell you that beavers don't build dams when you put them in ponds, and that they eat trees, and that 35% of the trees, um, only 35% of which, which um, actually regenerate through coppicing or suckering or whatever else because there are so many deer that nobody can get on top of <laughs> that this natural process that enables the trees to regenerate in so many ways when beavers cut them down is stopped by the deer so you spend a vast amount of money to learn not an awful lot next slide and at the same time as this is ongoing with the scientists and the great and the good and the trumpets what happens in the east of scotland is that some people on estates obtain beavers from Poland and Germany and they put them in enclosures on their land. And those beavers, a species which is born with a set of bolt croppers in its face, go through the fences or undermine the fences and escape out onto the Tay. And what you find on the River Tay is a vast river system 
that, that has a huge sufficiency of beaver habitat. Unlike Knapdale, where the beavers are put into glacial valleys, the ridges of which they can't cross. So they, when the two-year-olds try to find mates, they go out to sea and are lost. On the Tay, all you had to do was float up the river and down the river and find other mates. And before you know where you are, you were in a beaver elysium. And it's now reckoned, I think the last set of surveys that were done of the population there, reckoned that there's somewhere maybe in the region of one and a half thousand beavers on the Tay, with the population extending down into the fourth. And maybe in Knapdale, there's somewhere in the region of 40 or 50. So it just shows you that when you do the simplest of things in life, which is look for the good habitat, put the creatures in there, and don't worry about the politics, then the beavers know that a mummy beaver and daddy beaver are going to have baby beavers if they like each other, and off the species goes to do rather well. Next slide. And then years after that, you know, we're talking to to various people about uh, the possibility of applying for a, a beaver tra a, a beaver release project in, in in England, and a whole range of different sites are looked at. And it has to be said that some of the the organisations that are great advocates of beaver now were not great advocates of beavers ten fifteen years ago, and and. It became, you know, we the, the last, the, the site that we had most hoped for was the site of the, I think, of the Mevagissi stream, which runs down from the Lost Gardens of Heligan into the village of Mevagissi, where it was very unambitious. It was a relatively short stream system, lots of suitable habitat, not very complicated. Beavers couldn't easily get out of it because the catchment's isolated. And we were going to apply for a license to put beavers there. And we went through every single form there was in triplicate we borrowed the the information from scotland we spoke to natural england we spoke to defra we spoke to un old uncle tom cobley and all and in the end what what happened was that the minister got a single letter from the angling trust whose knowledge of beavers couldn't even be described as binary if you gave them a packet of crayons and a felt tip pen they wouldn't be able to draw one and on the basis of the fact that they told the minister that their dams would obstruct the movement of migratory fish, of which there were none in, in the catchment of the Mevagissi stream because the water flows out through the harbour underground, then the minister said, well, that's it. You know, it'll be, it'll be a case of I'll make the decision. And you knew what his decision was going to be. So that project came to an end and another like it came to an end in Roadford for reasons that were very, very similar. And then we just waited with the beavers that were in closures and hallelujah, one day beavers from somewhere um, were found living on the River Otter in Devon um, with babies. And, and though the minister who was Owen Patterson said they had to be shot or put in a zoo or whatever else, the local community rallied around them and said, you are not doing that. And it became the most magnificent exercise in social democracy, because see when it comes to how money is spent in this countryside, when it comes to the subsidies, when it comes to, to what landowners get for doing whatever they want to do, nobody else in society, even though they pay for it, has any say whatsoever in how that money is to be spent. And on that river, for a very short period of time, people young and old had the opportunity to stand in village halls and say, you are not killing them on our land. You are not taking these beavers away. You're not going to do this. And if you come with your hired acolytes from AFA to trap them on our river, we'll go out with, with, um, with, 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 with angle grinders and we'll cut your traps up and we'll throw them in the bottom of it and you can retrieve them from there. So the beavers were eventually, after a lot of wrangling, allowed to stay. There was another trial run which showed us Everything that we'd already been told by the Americans and Europeans that beavers would do, and the beavers were allowed to stay. And at the same time as this was happening, nobody knows who's doing it. Other people had let beavers go on the on the Tamar and on some of the other southwestern river systems. There was a massive beaver population on the River Stour in Kent. There are beavers, you know, in the far north on the Bewley. And people had just decided that see all this legislation and nonsense and rules that are drawn up to ensure that when you start to play a game that you always lose. You're never, ever going to win when, when, when you enter the portal of that game that it was time to play a different game. Next slide. So now we're in a time where there's even more legislation. There are people employed by the statutory nature conservation authorities and by the environment agency to prepare the way for a bright new future where a few beavers, you know, under 
you know, very strict set of conditions might one be, day be re reintroduced into a river officially or gravel pit officially. But because we have a government in power that has no interest in this sort of thing at this point in time, we have beaver officers employed the length and breadth of England who are operating in counties where there are no beavers. And I have absolutely no idea what these people do when they come in to begin their working day at nine and finish at five. I don't know, maybe they're making beaver Christmas cards or candles or writing letters to their gran. Next slide. So these creatures, when you read all the nonsense that's written about them and issues with game fish and farmers saying they're going to flood land, guys, it's a really well-studied species. And the most important thing you must bear in mind is that when they decide to settle in the upper watershed of a river and build their great stick nests or lodges with the dams and impoundments that surround them, that these are the creatures that return life to the earth. Everything that revolves around water, everything's a wetland species. In the beginning, we were a wetland species. When we were a, a hominid living, leaving Africa, we looked for the wetlands because we knew that's where the game, you know, the big game came and we could find it and kill it with great ease. Everything's a wetland species. And when beavers make these habitats, all life returns to them. Next slide. And what you find is that you have pool after pool opening up and things like the frogs that have no still water and that produce spawn that's destroyed by currents. Well, they are able to stay again and produce in ever increasing numbers. The landscape, next slide, that's fine. The landscapes they create are complicated. They have meanders and bends and offline pools. Ducks return, dragonflies return. On our own farm, we start a, st a study with with the British Dragonfly Society two years ago because we found that there were, you know, the beavers, bless them, have found our farm and they are here in some numbers. And we found that there were there was a population here or something like 50 small red damselflies, which for Devon and Cornwall, they told me was quite astounding. Last year, there was 250. This year, there's 650. And there's 650 of these things simply because they've got somewhere to stay and in the place where they're living, they have food. Next slide. And that same equation applies to everything else. They can make things better. Here's a, here's a you know, 25 years ago, people reintroduced beavers to Belgium. Here's an upland, um, you know, purple moor grass moor with no sheep, where the sheep have gone and agriculture's finished. Look at how quickly those trees go when those browsers aren't there. And look at how quickly the beavers come back into a landscape that you'd think was utterly ruined and by making pool systems and blocking the old drainage ditches around the edge the water flows out back into the land and they burrow into it like gigantic furry moles to provide pond after pond mere after mere and because it's an acid um you know it's an upland acid peat based system the sphagnum moss which of course will kind of hold can 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 withhold 60 times its own volume of water starts to grow again in great abundance to the point where it starts to block the beaver ponds they can restore very much next slide and with them comes life. You know, on the farm now, you know, I bought the farms 20 years ago. They were burnt out dairy farms where everybody who tried to farm dairy and in, in even succession failed with the same old failure that everybody else had tried before. Vast amounts of public money to drain it, to fertilize it, to keep it all going were poured into these useless, witless enterprises. And to do that, they plowed up the old grasslands. They destroyed a landscape which delicately would have held black grouse and curlews and short-eared owls and hen harriers and very, you know, in, in great, great, great abundance, you know, within less than a lifetime. And what we've been doing is we've been turning it back. The beavers have taken over the wetland and the valley bottoms, and we've been through through a process of scarification and and reseeding and 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 and, and bits of um, you know bits of light plowing, you know, using the right kind of animals. All of a sudden, things are returning to this farm slowly, but but in increasing numbers and with increasing speed to create something that's becoming a natural delight. Next slide. 
We have just finished a series of static bat um, recording analysis over the course of the last six weeks, and it's bat central. There are whiskered bats here, there are Bechstein's bats here, there are Leisler's bats here, there are bats that I never ever would have thought would have come back to burnt out dairy farmed environment. And they are here because the water is here, the beavers are here, the insects are here, the decaying trees are here, the holes that the woodpeckers make for them are here and the bats are moving in. Next slide. The bird list I always thought was unimpressive until year on year you sit down and you look at it and you think, actually, some of these things have never been here before. There were no stone chats. There were no reed buntings. The skylarks finished 10, 15 years ago. This year we had a wind chat. There are willow tits breeding here. This year we had the first cuckoo. Time and time again, this class of life is, is beginning to provide some real surprises. Next slide. And it's my earnest hope that, you know, the, the grasshopper warblers that we had last year will come back again and breed the, the Cyril buntings from, that we know are not far away as a result of reintroduction of the south hams um, will, will also come to my farm. And the, with the rock piles that we're putting in to the farmed landscape that were taken out by the, 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 the Cistercian monks and their alakites a thousand years ago, that the wheat ears that migrate across us to Dartmoor year on year will one year settle and breed. Next slide. So it's not all about loss. It doesn't have to be this way. We can develop a partnership with the other land use industry. We can rewild the least productive of the land in terms of food, its ability to produce food. And we can, we can enable, we can start to set nature free and return it with our assistance to a point where it can produce great biodiversity of its own. That's not not using the land. It's using the land for something else. White storks, we have a breeding group here next year. Now that we've established another four or five breeding flocks to, to ward off bird flu, next year we'll be releasing our first, first white stork chicks out into the landscape surrounding us. Next slide. And when we finish with the whites, we'll start with the blacks. They haven't been here since the time of Geraldus Cambrensis in the 1170s. There is no reason at all why in this lifetime we can't start with complicated birds like this. Next slide. So it's a panoply of life that comes back when you restore the beaver. It's not about one animal. It's about the bog pimpernel. It's about the snakes and the frogs and the spoonbills and the butterflies and the dragonflies. It's everything that returns when they give it the opportunity to live again. Next slide. So last week I was in Bavaria. Um, we are a small organization as well. <laughs> I write books. We do all sorts of different things to 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 make money, to make a stack up. Farming is now a tiny, tiny part of of our income stream. Uh, but now we are in higher level stewardship, and we're being paid to produce flowers and dragonflies rather than sheep, which I, I find a much more satisfying pastime. Beavers are everything that it says in the packet about them, but it's not a battle which is by any manner of means over, and perhaps it never will be, because we're a very, very greedy and domineering species. Everything about us demonstrates that we always want it all, and we want it forever. But we're beginning to learn that the cost of us having what we have held and what we've recovered from landscapes which simply can't produce much in the way of food or deliver any other good has come at a terrible price and that the economic costs of continuing uh, to support sheep production in the uplands and the numbers that they're currently kept at or, or to, 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 to canalise rivers and pull out the bairns even higher every time there's a flood event so the next time the water comes it hits the primary schools and the villages downstream um, you know, even harder is simply not acceptable and that we need to look again at how we restructure the land to create a landscape that we've, we've, we've made but to reshape it into a landscape where there's room for farming to produce the food that we all need in the most productive and most fertile land, room for, for the recreation that many of us increasingly want and, and room for other wildlife and other species as well. Thank you very much indeed ladies and gentlemen. Thank you very much, Derek. Tour de force, as uh, as we had no doubt. Um, yeah, first comment in the chat says legend. Um, some of us would like to be more youthful than that, but, you know, I'm sure you'd take it. We've got <laughs> quite a few questions already. So just to remind you, if you have a question, um, please, can you put it in the Q&A? Um, so let me see what's the best one to start with. Um, uh, well, here's one I can put to you, Derek. Fascinating talk. Where can we find out more about Derek and his work? Buy my books. 
the 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 um the world is there's one coming out in um at oxford book um literary festival on the um 7th of um march next year and it's called um a hunt for the shadow wolves is the history of the wolf in britain and and what we did to them and what happened to them and it's a very a very very complicated story it never ends with a big fight on a mountain pass it ends as ever with social change that the that brought th that made things in its week entirely different and just meant this animal just couldn't cling on for any longer so um we're going to be redoing our websites and we're also going to be we're 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 starting a membership scheme for our own small charity to try and get an income stream in that's going to pay for people to work in education and increasingly to pay for for recovery projects that we're involved with for things like twites and roll crickets little things that really need a hand and um so if you just you know bear with us that that will be on the go in the next few weeks and then after that there'll be a revised web um web page but we'll be doing a a range of different events here next year for members and also a range of different storytelling events at the farm as well so i mean if you're interested in coming call on holiday to cornwall come and stay here there you go well taken that chance for a promotion um couple about um uh sort of what people can do so um one or two saying if they want to make a genuine difference to the natural world what should they do they feel sort of horrified at the moment but powerless what what, what should they do if you will obviously there's the, the there's the obvious answer saying support the best of the organizations that are around you but the other thing you can also do is if you've got land you know start shutting the gate just stop the damn grazing there are plenty of sheep out there there are plenty of other animals taking the the vegetation down to the the epidermis of the earth, stop it. Start to put rock piles back and start to put log piles back and dig many ponds. You know, make sure you put them in south facing aspects of the land you own. If you don't own land, can you buy land together with other people? Because if you own the land, then 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 you can dictate what happens. That's always the argument with the other people who who determine the fate of a landscape is it's our land, we'll do what we want with it. Well, if it's your land, you can act in the interest of the natural world. So I would urge you to look at that. But if you can't do that, then Get involved with guerrilla gardening. Get involved with organisations that are actually doing things, and 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 in that there is you know there is purpose and strength. Would you recommend people get involved in what might be at its widest called lobbying about trying to influence locally landowners, companies, MPs, governments? Definitely the MPs, because they don't like getting more than 15 letters. They get more than 15 letters about a subject, and they tend to pay attention to it. So when you see, you know, just a stupid story again about beavers causing flooding or whatever else, then you know your subject well enough, and there are plenty of good books and plenty of information out there. Get the River Otter Beaver Trial document. It's, it's downloadable on the web, and it goes through many things, like, you know, the study and impact on game fish and invertebrates and amphibians and you just write to those mps because you can be sure that the people who are idiots are writing to them as well they always do that and then their big loud voice is heard and your voice is not heard at all lobbying mps is a good thing make their life hell um that's what they're there for and and, and you must do that when it comes to to influencing landowners you know honestly you meet so many decent people that don't need to be influenced at all they're out there in spades and, and many of them are farmers. They're people who, who look at what's been done and are looking to a future and deciding it's going to have to be and should be very different to what went before. But for the ones that are set on a course of action and are, are determined that it's going to be farming forever, well, what do you do about them? I mean, it's, it's you know, here you have the Commons and Dartmoor and the big fight about paying people that have absolutely trashed the environment having had millions and millions of pounds worth of taxpayers money spent on them and they're now holding out their hand and saying even though everyone's dead we want more that's called plunder it's a culture that used to pertain to people called pirates and what the pirates did was they went out to see in a boat and they came and they stole all your money and they never gave it back and they spent it on whatever they liked that's piracy there can be little or no sympathy for the people that don't want to change with some caution, I'll uh, I'll sort of tiptoe towards wild release and government. A um, few questions mm. around. So, for example, the beavers in Cropton Forest, their dam is the picture behind me. 
Mm -hmm. uh, are they supposed to stay in an enclosure forever? Uh, one's about um, the different U countries within the UK take different approaches. How's that going to progress? Um, what should people do at the moment if they're thinking about a cage release but might spend a lot on fencing that's going to be unnecessary? No, until, until a new administration comes in, all what we know you will get from Therese Coffey is nothing. She is somebody that believes beavers are fundamentally bad. She's always made that very clear. It's deeply personal. She is never going to allow you know, wild releases of these animals. So despite what people tell you and despite what comes from natural England, the political reality is that as long as she sits on her throne, nothing will happen. But hopefully her time is near done. We'll see. And when it comes to, to wild releases, they should be everywhere. And we shouldn't be cautious about it. We are the most ridiculously cautious nation. You know, any other, I mean, I think it's, you know, if you, okay, there are free living beavers in Britain, but they've all more or less come from illicit releases. But, you know, who gives a shit? In 100 years' time, do you think anybody's ever going to pick up a paper when they've got a beaver, you know, gnawing away through the garden gate to come and get the raspberry bushes from the edge of the river and say, well, ha, beaver didn't come from somebody that filled in form T36 and, and, and missed a dot on the I in line 37. Who cares? You know, at the end of it all, you know, we, and actually there used to be a range of completely non-entity Western European countries that hadn't reintroduced beavers formally at scale. And would you believe it's now down to us and the Vatican City? And at this rate of knots, those Swiss, they're going to be in past the Swiss guards and frolicking in a font before they get anywhere near the Thames. So we should be a much, much more robust bunch of people. We know everything we need to know about them. We know how to do it. We should be doing this fast because we have big problems out there. It's not a case. I've just been through, you know, the fact there's, there's this Elysium that's somewhere between us and heaven where things are working well. It's mm -hmm. absolutely the case that things are very, very bad. And what are we going to do if we don't do this? Nothing's going to get any better. Mm -hmm. And you go to so many wetland sites now where you look at it and think, how the hell is it going to get any worse? Without these, we, we, have, we have a very gl grim and bleak future to mm -hmm. look forward to. Am I right to think, Derek, that if you compare beavers with the recovery of otters, so in my lifetime, at the start, otters were nowhere, and now they're pretty much all over the place. They're a lot otters more, more mobile between than... catchments rather than just up and no, down. No, they have great difficulty moving between catchments. Otters will move between different catchments at ease. And bear in mind that the otter, otter's recovery was in, in the southwest was due to natural regeneration. But right the way through the east of England and down and Kent and beyond, a huge, huge areas of Britain, it was down to the Otter Trust. It was down to a few determined people breeding otters, kind of commonly in a fashion that was disliked by the disapproving nature conservation authorities and just letting them go. They did it. And 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 even though they're forgotten now, their legacy are these animals that are everywhere. They were a remarkable bunch of people. Not much fun sometimes to get on with, but they did what they said they were going to do. And that's what we need for beavers now. So we should presumably start lobbying um, shadow nature and environment ministers, I think one of whom is the MP in the neighbouring constituency here. Good. You make a big fuss. Yeah. Go and knock on the door. Tell them you're not voting for them. At the moment, they're a wee bit jumpy about that. Tell them we're getting bugger all from you unless they agree to this. Sadly, I'm definitely not voting for him because he's the next constituency on, but um, we do <laughs> have people within the network that are there, so I'm sure they will. A couple more ecological ones. Um, How's the genetic diversity of beavers within the UK to give resilience? Very good. Whoever, I mean, we brought many animals in from Bavaria, some from Poland. So the the animals that were used to establish population in Bavaria came as a, a came from all over Europe. There were two ways of thinking about them at the beginning of the European reintroductions. One was you got animals that were nearest in type to what was there, and the other was that because they've been killed down to something like. I don't know, four to 600 animals in Western Europe was that you just got as much of a mix as you could. And the Bavarian ones were a mix. And not only that, they also got some from Russia. So when it comes to the, the genetics of the beavers that are in Britain at, the mo at, at this point in time and going forward, because you're never going to eliminate them. There are too many of them out there now, is, is, is as good as it's going to get. Thank you. And the last ecological one, um... There's an abundance of rivers and becks in Yorkshire. How do you assess where's suitable for beavers? Well, 
And don't you think I'm being nasty to Yorkshire, but any time I move through there, the thing that always impresses me are how few trees there are. And to get the trees going, something needs to stop. And the thing that needs to stop are the sheep. So when you look at that picture of, of, of Belgium and that deep purple moorgrass, those trees wouldn't even be 10 years old. And it shows you where you've got a seed source, the trees can start to come like hell, but they can't come if the sheep are there. It's as simple as that. So until they really are dealt with for the blight they are, then it's going to be very difficult to see how you recover some environments because the environments they create are environments that are are, are near totally sterile and dead. We certainly do have some enlightened landowners who have either drastically reduced or stopped their sheep grazing and uh, started to put some trees in, one of which is across the valley here at Denton, which I know you've visited, mm. Derek. Oh, yes, good, yeah. good people. Yeah. yeah. Um, okay, uh, last question before we must wrap up. Um, Richard says, you describe a farming idyll at the end of your presentation, but ca can farmers really make a living if they follow this path? Um, is elms fit for purpose? I'd invite you, Derek, to talk a bit well, about the anybody know what elm, you've done. Does anybody know what elms is? I mean, no, there's, uh, there's no figures attached to it at this point in time. It's I think it's elms that's the idyll rather than anything else. Yeah. It's, farming's in for a tough time is the honest truth of the matter. When you look at it, it's when the single farm payment goes, which buoyed out Boyed up and 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 made so many businesses possible. Once that's gone, it's gone. Now I just actually read a thing from Savills today about biodiversity net gain, and they're advocating the that the farmers take this on board themselves and use it as another income stream. But but for biodiversity net gain, you're going to have to start changing landscapes. You're going to have to start restoring wetlands, allowing scrub regeneration. You're going to have to put scrapes in, rocks in. Maybe you're going to have to reintroduce species because much of what you've got in the farmed environment is a landscape that's completely trashed. I mean, short of, of dropping Agent Orange from the air and spreading plutonium over the grasslands, it's hard to see how it's going to, some of it's going to get much worse. So you're going to have, if, for, if you want that kind of money, then you're going to have to do something for it. And I'm quite sure for a lot of the people that are farming at this point in time, it's going to, the change will be beyond them and the change will have to come with the other people that come after them. And that's not a nice thing to have to say, but it's the truth of the matter. There's no way that that industry, short of, of just reconstituting BPS and walking towards the edge of the cliff for a little longer, is going to be able to exist on, on the same sort of basis. It's over. So, it, and, and I'll tell you now that when you look at what I do, doing this is an incredibly hard thing to do. Fiddling around with your income stream, starting up trusts, philanthropic giving, everything we do to make this work is, is real hard work. We spend, I think we spend 48,000 a month on the staff and the projects that are here. Every year you sit down at the turn of the financial year and you look at it and think, how on, in the name of God are we going to make this stack up? But if I do what would be all so easy to do and just say, well, that's it. There's the capital value of the land. I've had enough. I've just had enough. I'm tired. I'll go and write or I'll go and sculpt or I'll go and line a beach somewhere for what life I've got left in me. Then that's the end of, of, of clear thinking with regard to water voles. It might be the end of doing things with cats. This is not being facetious. You, for some of these things to happen, you need to have people who are very, very focused on, on finding a way through every damn obstacle. So in the end, there are no obstacles. It's just going to happen. Too many people who've been involved with species restorations are, end up entirely frustrated because of the, the obstacles that are put in their way. And things just fall by the wayside because people just in the end give up. I'm not giving up at this point in time. Yeah, you're an inspiration to all of us, Derek. Um, we need to uh, start drawing to a close there. But thanks for given us the kind of historic and cultural background at the beginning. Um, pragmatism and determination, I think, running through the whole thing of it, as you say, to get through all these obstacles to make it happen. And just showing what that complexity of ecosystems can bring when, when something like the, the beavers enable it. So, uh, yeah, we've had uh, 100 people on, or 100 connections, so people are sharing more than that. Um, we have recorded, Derek, so we'll check with you afterwards if you're happy for us to publish that online. No, I don't um, care what you do. Help yourself. It's nothing <laughs> well, I haven't it, said before. It reaches even further and spreads the message Good. further. Good, carry on. So, uh, 
yeah, we're um, we're delighted to do that.